What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because you're already an entrepreneur. It's just that your day job might be your biggest client right now. Hat tip to Julian Gordon for that one. This week, we're diving into a sub niche of the real estate investing world with a longtime listener of the show who is cash flowing 10 grand a month from her portfolio of mobile homes. Rachel Hernandez is the author of Adventures in Mobile Homes, and she blogs and podcasts about her work at adventuresinmobilehomes.com. Stick around in this one to learn why these might make an attractive investment, namely they cost less than traditional houses but still have strong cash flow. We're going to cover how to find potential deals near you and how Rachel markets for tenants as well. Notes and links are at sidehustlenation.com slash mobile homes. And while you're there, make sure to download my free bonus. It's a list of 25 other, call them unconventional things that you can rent out for a profit. Again, that's at sidehustlenation.com slash mobile homes or through the link in the episode description of your podcast player app. It's definitely a niche. I will tell you there's not much competition. Your competition are basically homeowners or people are actually living in these communities and they decide to, you know, hey, I can just buy one and rent it out or buy one, fix it up and resell it to someone else. And sometimes the park managers does their own deals, but they can't buy everything. So that's where you can come in as an investor And the main difference between mobile homes and other niches like single family homes, apartment buildings, duplexes, not anyone can buy a mobile home in a mobile home park or a community and do business in that community. You have to get approval by the park manager or the owner, which takes networking and time and, you know, uh, skills to do that. So that's pretty much the main difference. The other difference between mobile homes and other niches in real estate is that mobile homes are mobile. So you think, oh, okay. But, you know, you get options. So like with a single family home, you're basically stuck. You know, it has to be in that location. I've never seen like a single family home slab foundation like moved. (laughs) With a mobile home, you can leave it in that location or you can have it transported to another community, a mobile home lot, or a mobile home, like a piece of land where the mobile home can sit on. So you've got options with mobile homes. Is the cash flow strategy the same? Like I'm going to buy this thing, perhaps finance it, put a tenant in place, and then bank on that cash flow difference? I mean, the strategy is the same. I would say with mobile homes, though, in general, of course, this depends on the location, Mobile homes are typically less money out of pocket than your traditional single family home. The first deal that I did on a mobile home, it was a two bedroom, one bath. I only paid $3,600 for the home cash. So that's not a down payment. That's just like the price of the house. <laughs> yeah. And they even cleaned it, Nick. <laughs> asked the the wife and she said oh yeah sure we'll clean it I mean you you never know so but yeah that was the price of the home and basically they wanted to move out of the community and just get into a regular single family home and they had lived there for 10 years it was an older home I think it was mid 1980s but it had central heat and air conditioning it was a two-bedroom home I bought it for $3,600 and I feel, had filled it in two weeks. I found a family for it. I believe I sold it for $10,000 and they gave me $1,000 as a move-in fee. And then they paid me $250 a month for four and a half years for it. So that was like a lease to own type of deal? Lease with option of purchase, yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, that sounds fantastic. Yes, the lower price point is another really important differential between single family homes. Because yeah, if I'm looking at a 20% down payment on a $200,000 property versus saying, oh shoot, I could buy 10 mobile homes at 3,600 bucks a piece. This is all of a sudden a strategy that might scale a little bit. Is that a typical price point? Because I'm, you know, I was like, well, shoot, what's available near me? And I see prices that are at least a couple orders of magnitude higher than that. 
on the area, I will tell you a lot of my deals, I find them through networking with the park managers. A lot of these deals that I find, they never hit the market. So either it's a referral from the park manager. That one, I believe I was passing out flyers in the park and I was just talking to residents. Okay. And I had already built up a relationship with a manager. And the manager's like, sure, you can work here. And I'm like, I might talk to some people and, you know, see, you know, if there's anyone moving. But if you know anyone, let me know. And she's like, sure, sure, sure. So she saw me walking around the park, (laughs) you know. Okay. So I really got in there. (laughs) But yeah, these deals are pretty much through word of mouth. And I have some park managers, you know, Every month or a couple months, they call me and they say, Rachel, I've got this in the park and it's definitely under market. So I don't typically buy those older ones anymore. Like, a, you know, the like my first deal. Typically, I try to buy bigger homes now because I work with bigger families. And so I'm paying about ten to fifteen thousand dollars cash on the properties that I buy now. But I did want to say something, Nick. So these homes, it's personal property. So you're just buying the home, not the land underneath the home because they are in communities. So with a single family home, you're buying the building and the land. So I just wanted to let everyone know that. So you would be responsible for lot rent to the park, to the community, and that would be your main monthly expense on it. Yeah, well, pretty, no, actually, yes, I will be responsible if the person doesn't pay the lot rent. So they pay me the payment for the home, and then they're responsible for the lot rent to the park. Now, if they don't pay and they get behind, then the park manager knows to call me, say, hey, Rachel, you need to bring this up current. So I'm working with a couple different people. (laughs) Okay, I'm thinking like in a traditional single family the tenants write you one check and then you, from that money, you pay your property taxes and your mortgage and, you know, all the other stuff, uh, insurance that's included there. So you're saying, hey, I'm going to have the tenant do part of that work for me. They pay the lot rent and then they pay me on top of that. For these properties, for these houses that are in the ten to 15000 range, what do they typically rent for? Oh, well, basically, uh, my cash flow on these homes, I get about 500 to $600 per month cash flow. So I've got some people on electronic payment, but I just take money order or cashier's check. I don't take personal checks. That comes to me. And then the lot rent for the park, they write a separate payment for the lot rent to the park. Okay. So the park lot rent could be $400, $500. So if they're paying the park $400 and they're paying me $500, it's a total of $900 for the person living in the home. Okay. Now I will say you can do it the way I do it. There are other people who just, you know, they just take a full amount. Like the rent is $900. Or the payment is, you know, this amount. And then the investor, you know, which is which would be me or you, Nick, we would just go around and write a check to the park for the lot rent. You can do it that way. I choose not to because okay. I don't want to get involved in all that. It's too much paperwork. So And that five to six hundred dollars in monthly cash flow, is that on just a long term lease or is that the lease option type of structure? Yeah, it's a lease with option of purchase. So basically, I have these people on 15 years. And I tell them at any time, you can pay off the home if you'd like. I'm really looking for people who they want to have that option to purchase something, but they just don't want to get tied into it because they want to leave the future open. But they kind of want to purchase something at the same time. But I will tell you, Nick, that I do take back homes. It's just part of the business. And I've had people, you know, call me, say, Rachel, I, you know, I lost my job. I got divorced. My parents are sick. I can't do this anymore. And that's when I have to take back the home. The number one reason for me to take back these homes have been divorced, though. So. And so at that point, say, okay, you had this 15 year lease to purchase agreement, but now you're behind 
on the payments. Like you have, the agreement is nullified because you broke your end of the contract type of deal. Yeah. And pretty much they just give me the keys back. And most of the people that I work with, we just keep the lines of communication open. Okay. I have had unfortunate incidences. You know, you get, you know, being in real estate, I have a love hate relationship with it. You do get a bad, few bad seeds where you have to go to court. So, but through that, as long as you've got your paperwork in place and you're professional, then, you know, you shouldn't have to worry as an investor. So I had this one lady, it was too crazy. She got uh, divorced from her husband and she fell behind. And I was like, you just need to leave. You just need to leave. And so she had this whole sob story in front of the judge. And I went to court, it was like three times. And the judge was like, next time I see you, you're out. And she just kept going back and going back and going. But I had this, I was like, you know what? We were here a few months ago. Here's my paperwork. Here's what it says in writing. And then she finally moved out. And then I had to, you know, fix up the house again. So it is part of the business. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of that 80-20 rule. You probably have. Yes. But (laughs) it's that 20% or you'll have issues. That cause 80% of the headaches. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. 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 (laughs) Okay. Now, this is is really interesting. I'm, you know, I'm clearly looking in the wrong areas because the ones that I see nearby are kind of in the $199,000 range. And there's some, yeah. like, some smaller <laughs> ones. So like this one, uh, this is actually in the Northwest. This doesn't look too bad, actually. $80,000 for a three-bedroom. That's a small three-bedroom, but that's not too bad. Do you have a rule of, I mean, I'm not, I wish I could get in at 10 or 15 grand and have something cash flowing 500 bucks a month. And all of a sudden you're looking at 50% annual cash on cash returns. And like, that's, you know, you're never going to find that in single family. At least I don't think you might uh, these days, but I guess if I were to do this, I'm going to follow your advice. I'm going to start building relationships with park managers first, rather than looking at the MLS. So it's kind of a, a driving around, seeing what is available in your town, or are there just some areas of the country that just, this is not going to work for you? No, because I've actually had a student from California buy deals. Unfortunately, the lot rent is crazy and you can't really do that much about the lot rent in places like California. I had a student, they bought a home. I guess these people fell behind with lot rent. They bought a home in California for $4,000. Wow. And the lot rent was $1,000 a month. Uh. (laughs) Yeah. And they were able to fill it because in California, there's people who are looking to move into manufactured housing because it is affordable housing. Right. So, and they basically, I asked them, how did you find it? Just like what you told me, just go into the neighborhood, talk to the manager, you know? So I don't want to say that these deals can't be found. You just have to kind of talk to the right people. And then be there at the right place at the right time. I was in sales, you know, I was a sales executive (laughs) for Fortune 500 corporations. So I kind of know about sales and networking. Okay. So basically, you just have to kind of understand when you talk to the manager, hey, you know, if you know anyone, they've got to move, but you got to keep reminding them because they've got a million other things to do. Same thing with the mobile home dealerships. They just want to sell new homes to their customers. But if they've got customers with old homes to sell and they need that cash to buy their new homes, then if you can come in as the investor, like, hey, I'll take it off their hands, but you got to, you know, we got to work something out, then, you know, you can get in there and make a deal as an investor. And I will say, Nick, I mean, a lot of people think, oh, it's just the numbers. It's just the numbers. Not really. A lot of times these sellers, when they they are in that situation where they're motivated to sell, they do want to sell, but they want to sell to the right person. So it's not always about how much can you offer me. Okay. So it's about building trust and um, on both ends and creating win-win situations for everyone. Yeah. It's such an interesting little niche in the real estate world, you know, until, you know, coming across your stuff years ago, it's like, I never, this is not, not really on my radar. What's the conversation like? So just roll up to a park nearby and 
look, is there a management office or is it just the first home that you come to? You knock on the door. Like, what does that conversation look like for somebody brand new? Or does it start with, you know, a phone call or, or an email? Yeah. So basically what I do, and this is what I tell people to do, is basically just visit all the parks in your area. Every single one. Just look them up. This is an exercise. This is what I did. I visited over 200 parks in my area wow. the first time, you know, when I got into this. Every single one. The low end parks, the middle of the road parks, the nice parks, you name it. And see, okay, do I like this park? Do I not like this park? Drive around. Don't even go into the office. Okay, okay. <laughs> you don't want to go into the office. Just drive around. And if it's something that you don't think you feel yourself doing business in that part, don't even pursue it. You know, <laughs> if you don't feel comfortable there at night or even during the day, don't even pursue it. Cross it off your list. And then just make a list of parks that you do like that are kind of nice. And then once you, you know, got that down, then you want to go to the park, drive around, figure out, okay, what kinds of people live here. Um, you can tell a lot by the way they keep their yards and the porches, if there are any loose animals. And if it's a park that you like, I drive around a couple minutes, then I go into the office, and then usually the manager's there or their assistant, or sometimes even the owner's in there. So you just go in there, and then if they're on the phone, just kind of wait, then just say, oh, hi, uh, my name's Rachel, I was just driving by. And I just wanted to find out some more information about the park. And that's it. Okay. Don't say, I'm an investor. You know, I'm going to, you know, I buy this for cash flow. No, you know, <laughs> that's kind of what. And then they'll just kind of go in the spiel. And then it's kind of more of an art to kind of build the relationship. And I do go over this. I think it was episode eight. I have a podcast on this on how to talk to the park managers okay. and how to approach them. You know, because it, you ha it, it's more of an art and it does take time to build up that relationship. Okay, that's helpful. So don't come in, guns are blazing. Hey, I'm an investor. I'll, you know, we buy a home's cash, any condition. Like, whoa, slow down here, you know. There are people that do that, okay. actually. And that's a different style, And but that's not my style. So, you know. Okay. And so the reason to do that is you want to be the first call if they kind of catch wind that somebody might be moving or needs to move, you, you want them to call you versus going on to the MLS or anything like that. Exactly. And you might actually be in there and there might be a resident paying lot rent and they may be all like, hey, I'm going to be selling. I'm thinking about because they go in there to pay lot rent, like yeah. physically go in there. And or, oh, I know so and so. But if you say you're an investor, they're not going to say anything to you. <laughs> you OK, know? yeah, so, that's interesting. Like I tell people, like, don't dress like in a suit, but then don't dress too casual. So just kind of, you know, you know, look uh, presentable. <laughs> OK, OK. Do you ever move these things? So they are. Mo you mentioned they're mobile. Like, do you ever put them on a trailer and move them to a different park? Yeah, several times, actually. <laughs> and the reason why is because I could find something in a park that I really don't want to do business in. And I've had several of those just because the park might not be the nicest, but the person selling it, their home is in pretty good condition. So I've moved it that way. I've moved it from a piece of land to a different park. But I will say that takes a little bit of experience and skill. So I don't recommend people do this if they're just starting out. If someone is interested, I would suggest doing your first deal inside a community. Okay. Yeah. Leave, leave it where it is because it's, it's got to be expensive to move, right? Oh, yeah. You've got moving fees and then you've got hookups because they got to disconnect all the utilities. So water, electric, yeah. gas air conditioning. Now, if you have the condenser outside, you have to have an air conditioning person take that condenser, store it in their facility until you get it to the new location, and then they can connect it. Okay. You don't want it sitting out there in the new location. <laughs> I mean, those condensers are like a couple thousand dollars, you know, so. Okay. They're mobile, but don't move it if you don't have to, kind of a thing. 
Right, right. I imagine that's one reason why the original owner would sell it too. It's like, well, we don't want to move it either, so it's going to sit here. Yeah, usually they don't want to move it because it's kind of a hassle to do it. <laughs> you know, these deals in this price range, kind of the low five-figure price range, is there any sort of financing on them or it's like you pretty much are going to need to bring cash to the table? No, some owners do finance. I mean, it really depends on, you know, their situation. But in my experience, I mean, there have been. And those are people who actually, they have a mortgage on it already. And for me, I if they have a mortgage on it, unless it's a low balance, I just don't even pursue the deal. I don't do that subject to, I don't do any of the sandwich option, lease option. I don't do any of that. I would just prefer to buy it straight out cash. And typically the people I buy it from, they fall in that category. They've been living in that home for at least five years. If it's less than that, they probably have a mortgage on the home. Okay. Even if it's a private mortgage with another seller investor like you? Yeah. Yeah. I don't even pursue those those opportunities. Okay. So you want you know no liens on the place. Hopefully the existing sellers own it free and clear. And then your finance option is basically to have them you know, do owner financing to you or is there like bank financing or other structured financing for this? Basically for me, I would just buy it cash. Like I have my cash and I purchase it. Right. And then if I sell it on the selling end, basically I would do the lease with option to purchase unless they had the cash to purchase it for the purchase price, which usually they don't. But if they do, there's that option as well, too. But typically, it's basically lease with option to purchase that I do. And then they that's how I get my cash flow on these deals. Okay, I guess, let me rephrase, let me rephrase that. If I didn't have 15 grand to buy one of these things outright, assuming I found this deal, is there financing available to me? Like, could I go to the bank and get a 30-year mortgage on, on a mobile home? Well, this is personal property, so it would probably fall under a personal loan, unsecured, if it was at a lower price point. Are you doing anything special to advertise for tenants on the lease with option to purchase side? Well, basically, I do a couple of things. The first thing is I put a sign in the window. And then the second thing is I tell the park manager... And then after I tell the park manager, if they have a bulletin board, I put my flyer up on the bulletin board. And then I put signs outside of the park about the home, very close to the park entrance. And then I have flyers and I pass out the flyers around the park. I personally do this. Some people are like, well, why don't you just hire someone to do it? I'm like, I can't hire someone to do this because this Business is really people oriented. So the park manager likes when they see me walking around because they're driving the park because they've has their inspections on the home. Okay. And when they, they stop and then we chit chat and, oh yeah. And then, you know, oh yeah, you know what? I did talk to someone and they were interested. I'll have them call you. Those referrals are so much better than if you just kind of, you know, did an advertisement in the newspaper or online. Okay. Um, Because a lot of people like, you know, you advertise in the newspaper or Craigslist or next door. Those are like, the majority of those are looky-loos and it's it's just, it's just a waste of time. You want people who actually, they have family or friends in the park already. And those family members or friends, they already want to live in the park. They're already sold on the community. They just need to find a home to buy. Okay, so that's why it makes sense to flyer the neighborhood because they might know somebody who lives elsewhere but wants to get in there versus, oh, I'm going to move three doors down inside the same neighborhood. That was that was confusing, but it sounds like it's more for that word of mouth, like turn the existing residents into your marketing engine for, you know, hey, who else do you know? We got this availability here. Yeah, and Nick, I know it sounds like way too much work and a lot of investors are not willing to do this, but trust me. It will make things on the selling or renting end so much easier versus, oh, I've got like
like a hundred calls or a hundred emails, but these are from people who are not familiar with the neighborhood. They found your ad in the newspaper or on Craigslist versus I've got five good leads from a park manager. They want to live in the park. They already applied for the park and they are already approved to live there yeah. and they just need to find a home. I know it sounds like a lot of work, but it trust me, it, it, it works. No, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I don't want a hundred leads. I want those three, four, five good leads and you can go from there. And a lot of people are not willing to do that. So, and that could be an advantage for someone who actually wants to get into this business. Okay. Yeah. This is intriguing because it's based on the math that you're sharing. It's like, it's not going to take a ton of these to potentially build up enough cash flow to replace your day job salary to, you know, make this a, a pretty compelling operation. Now, I'm about to ask Rachel about her time involvement and time management, because there's a lot of parallels here to other flavors of investing, whether it's single family homes or raw land or even flipping products on eBay. It can take some legwork to source those deals or else you're just paying retail like everybody else. And now I am curious about the time management involved because you're talking about, you know, walking up and down the rows and passing out flyers and, you know, visiting 200 mobile home parks in person. What kind of management tools or practices or, you know, what kind of time are you putting into it today versus maybe, you know, five, 10 years ago when you're in full acquisition mode? Well, when I first started out, I was definitely working a lot. I remember one time I had some friends and they wanted to go, you know, I, we hadn't seen you, Rachel. They wanted, you know, to take me to go go out to eat. And I was actually at a park with the plumber. It was eight o'clock at night because we had a leak and he was fixing some things. This is when I first started out and I finally met up with them at dinner and we were waiting for our food to come in. And I just, I just dozed. I fell asleep and my head almost hit my plate of spaghetti. I was basically working 80 hours a week at that point. <laughs> so I will say it does take a lot of work in the beginning, just kind of networking, getting out there, getting people to know you. But once you figure in you know, you've got a few parks that you want to work in, then it gets easier because you already know the community, you already know the park manager. Now there is turnover. So if one park manager leaves, another one may come in and then it's the same thing over again. You got to introduce it. It's like, but I basically say, hey, I worked with this person. And usually they're so new. They're like, okay, <laughs> you, know? Yeah. you know, in the beginning, it was a lot about that. Now, for me right now, I work in a lot of corporate owned parks. So basically, they have sister parks. So I just got in and I've been trying to get into this park for years. But the manager, she was just really tough. And she finally decided to retire after I don't know how many years she was managing that thing, I think like 40 years. And so a new manager came in and she was like, Yeah, Rachel, you could work here. But then she left and then her assistant who I gave a Christmas present to during Christmas became the manager. And now she's cool with me working with her in her part. Okay. And that's a thousand lots in that one part. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so she's like, yeah, Rachel, you, you know, so she's because she's like, I remember you because you gave me a Christmas present, even though she was the assistant. So I give presents, not just for the, to the managers, but also to the assistant and to the maintenance people. Cause these people are my eyes and ears out there. Nice. That's a great tip. I had a picture of something much smaller in my head. Just like the ones that are in town here are uh, maybe 50 homes tops. Like they're not big places, but a thousand uh, home park. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, in the beginning I did, cause I was like, oh, you know, those bigger corporate owned, uh, they're not gonna let me work. And I was kind of scared. Yeah. So I did the, the small mom and pop which was okay, but I wasn't as comfortable with them. And there was one with a park owner. I mean, he was like, oh my goodness, so difficult. He was calling me, asking me to bring him home into this park. He was really micromanaging the park and it was one of, it was under 50 spaces. He micromanaged it. I had some residents in there because like he, he was like, you can do business. I had a home in there. And every month, I kid you not, Nick, he would go under every single trailer and check to see if there's leaks underneath the trailer because the lot rent included the water 
And he wasn't willing to pay the money to submeter the entire park so that everyone could pay individual water bills. Okay, okay. It was crazy. And I'm like, I cannot, I cannot deal with this. So for me, I came from a corporate background. So, you know, I was a sales executive for Fortune 500 corporations. So for me, I felt more comfortable working with corporate owned parks versus like the small mom and pop. But that's just me. It, okay. It's different for everyone. Yeah. What kind of time are you putting in these days to manage this portfolio? Well, right now, I mean, I do have to, you know, work when there are issues or there's a quote unquote crisis, but a lot of it can be done by over the phone. But when I take back homes, then I have to manage contractors. Before, I was doing a lot of the work and also my husband was helping me out too. But now I just kind of, I have to manage the contractors. So I actually physically have to go to the parks, make sure that the work is getting done and then continue along. Like if we're done with plumbing, what's the next step? Do we lay flooring? Do we put cabinets? Do we have countertops? But it's also an opportunity for me to go and see the park manager. Hey, I'm just stopping by. Oh, we haven't seen you. Oh, hey, do you have anything uh, up on the market? Oh, I think this person is selling, but that won't be for another three months. Okay. So it's kind of an excuse, but it's work, but it's not like I'm working 10 hours a day doing this. Yeah, that's fair. I remember reading one of your blog posts. This was several years ago, and I want to say... It involved finding a possum in one of the homes or something like you were doing a lot of the labor yourself and you're like, oh my gosh, I found this animal in the tub or something. Is that, am I remembering anything like this? Yes. And I took that out. Here's the story. So I got the bucket and my husband was like, just do it and just get it over with <laughs> and look, cause I know you're going to close your eyes. So I picked it, it was a baby possum. I picked it up from the bathtub from my little hand grabber, put it in the bucket. I know this is a crazy story. And I let it out. So yes, I let it out in the park. So there's those things that you still got to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it's crazy. <laughs> and I mean, any landlord has stories, you know, crazy tenant stories, like repair issues, everything that can go wrong does go wrong, but it, it comes with the territory, I imagine. Not everyone's willing, you know, to do this. I have an attorney and I, and, and I, and he's like, so what's going on with real estate? And I'm like, I'm still doing the mobile. He's like, oh my gosh, are you still doing, did you get a management company yet? I'm like, no. And he's like, how much time do you have to manage them? So, these things? But if you think about it, I mean, who has the most interest in your business? It's not going to be the management company. You still have to manage the management company. You know what I mean? So, and they have other clients as well, too. So I do spend time on the business, but I don't spend as much time as when I first started out when I was doing the business. I'm not working 10 hours a day versus having a job. Yeah. You know, you got to work that amount of time no matter what. So it's a trade off. Are you, actively trying to grow the portfolio or is that just kind of natural byproduct at this point of the relationships that you've built? Well, right now what I'm trying to do, I've got a few homes that I'm fixing up because I had to take them back, unfortunately. But once I finish fixing up these homes, my next step is to buy land. And basically I'm going to be working with um, some mobile home dealerships to Per, for them to have land for their customers. Because I know a lot of investors, they've got done the mobile home investing business, then they bought mobile home parks, then they bought mobile homes on land. And a lot of them, they sold their parks, they got out of doing what I'm doing in the communities, and they just keep going back to land. And so a lot of times it's like, it's so much less stress, you know, not dealing with the house, you're just dealing with the land and it's something that people are always looking for. So I've already talked to a couple of mobile home dealerships in my area and that is one thing that they are looking for for their customers. So either their customers will purchase the land for me and then I just finance the land or the customer will have a lender and the lender cashes me out and then they purchase the land through the lender. So either way, it's just kind of the next step of what I want to do for the future. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. As I was going to ask, is there any tax advantages to owning these things? Like, could you depreciate it like you could a house? 
you can, but <laughs> I was thinking about doing this myself. So it's, you know, it's a good question, Nick, in the beginning. But even if you do depreciate, you have to pay it back through that depreciation recapture. So it's not really worth it. <laughs> it's not really worth it. And then, you know, when you do depreciate anything, you have to list every single address to the IRS. <laughs> So basically, I just kind of claim it as regular income instead of trying to depreciate the thing because, I mean, honestly, <laughs> I'm going to have to pay that back anyways in the future. So, I mean, really, the cash flow really pays for itself. And I will say, like, you know, the taxes, the insurance on this, it's since it's personal property like a car, you know, like a car, it's personal property, it's not attached to land, the taxes is definitely way less than if you would bought a home attached to land. The taxes actually depreciate because the county sees it as a depreciating asset. That's another thing a lot of investors argue about mobile homes is like, well, I'm buying a depreciating asset even though I'm getting cash flow. So it really depends what your goals are. I mean, do you want cash flow or do you want to sell the thing for appreciation in the future? You know, so people have different goals. Yeah, two different paths to the same, you know, outcome of cash flow, financial security, financial independence. I mean, we talked to a woman who was renting out semi trucks and I was like, well, yeah, that's a depreciating asset. And yeah, they cost a lot of money and they get a ton of miles put on them. And then at the end of it, they're not really worth what you paid for it. But in between, you made some pretty good money on it. So I can see how that can work. And similar with single family homes, right? you can depreciate the structure but not the land. And here it's like, well, you got no land anyways. And the lot owner is paying their property taxes on the land and probably baking that into the lot rent. Anything else that we ought to know before people go uh, start knocking on doors here? <laughs> well, I will say, there's a lot of real estate gurus out there and they make it sound so simple. I mean, Real estate, I mean, for someone to go into real estate, you really have to dedicate time. It's not like just sitting at your computer making phone calls and that's all it is, wheeling and dealing. No, it's not even like that. You really have to know that you have to put the time to do this. And the people who actually succeed in real estate, they either have the connections and know people who know how to talk to other people or they're very good at talking with people and have those people skills. So either way, if you have the people skills or if you can get to know people with people skills to work with, you will succeed in real estate. But it t that's what it takes to be successful. So it's not as easy as you hear, you know, some of these gurus talking about it. It's not even like that. <laughs> How long was it for you, either in terms of years or in terms of number of units before this was a meaningful full-time income for you? Probably after 10 or 15 of these properties, um, then it, things got to be easier on that. But, you know, I will say, Nick, I mean, I've been doing this since 2006, 2007, and it's yeah. 2021. <laughs> and even before that, I know I'm going to age myself here. I started, but I was really young when I started, um, you know, in real estate with single family homes in the early 2000s. I believe it was 2002. So it's not like I just started this, you know, last year, you know, <laughs> so... It's a long haul. It's a relationship building thing. It's a little bit of a volume game, but you've shown that it can work. And I think that's really encouraging. If you are interested in learning more about this business, I encourage you to check out Rachel's site at adventuresinmobilehomes.com. She's got the book there. She's got the podcast there. Again, adventuresinmobilehomes.com. Rachel, thank you so much for joining me. Before I let you go, let's wrap this thing up with a number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Success is a journey, not a destination. So what I mean by that is I think when people first start out with any business venture, they focus so much on the destination, but they fail to realize that being successful isn't about that. It's about the journey. And that's where we learn the most, make mistakes and apply what we've learned. So know that going in, this is a long-term game. It's not a short-term game. So Focus on the journey, but not the destination, because a lot of people tend to do that. And I did that too, myself. But 
you know, take the time to go for a walk, spend time with your kids or your your family, do other things besides work all the time. Because, you know, that's kind of what life is about. And that's kind of why we're all doing this. For me personally, I'm in mobile home investing because I want to do the things I want to do, not have to do. And I'm sure that's the same for everyone else. So yeah, I like that one. It is very much about the journey, enjoying the path along the way, not just you know, what happens when you get to the, to there, you know, there is no, there is no there, you know, there's always just more journey at the end. So uh, success is a journey, not a destination. Rachel, really appreciate you joining me and we'll catch up soon. Great. Thanks, Nick. Notes and links for this episode are at sidehustlenation.com slash mobile homes. And while you're there, make sure to download your free bonus. It's a list I put together of 25 other unconventional things that you can rent out for a profit. Again, that's at sidehustlenation.com slash mobile homes or through the link in the episode description of your podcast player app. Big thanks to Rachel for sharing her story. That is it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of The Side Hustle Show. Hustle on.